Good morning, ladies. What a treat to be here with you this morning. And you're all looking very beautiful and uh, so nice to be in Bangalore. It's, I can't even remember when was the last time. It's been, of course, pre-COVID, everything. You know, COVID's kind of like a, uh, BC and AD. It's kind of the dividing line. You know, it was either pre-COVID or post-COVID. It's been a long time. But it's great to be here with you. Great to be in the presence of the Lord. And uh, thank you for inviting me. It's been a, it's a real pleasure. And I do, I love your theme. I love it. And it looks so pretty in here with the flowers and everything. Very nice. And I'm, as I begin, I just want to ask, have you had a good week? Did you have a good week this week? Good. Did any of you have any trouble this week or any trials? Yeah. It, you don't have to be ashamed to admit it. It isn't a lack of spirituality, actually. It's okay to say. <laughs> actually, there is one of the people in the Bible that said this, and you probably know who it is. Let's see if you can answer this quiz. He said, well, it's in his book, man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upward. And if you're... I can't see the PowerPoint from here, but uh, I see there's a typo on there. That's great. The very first one has a typo. As surely as far. Do you know who's, which book of the Bible that's in? Yeah, you do know that. <laughs> if anybody had a right to talk about trouble, it was Job. I mean, none of us, or well, I don't think so, have been through what he went through. But... Uh, I just want to say that in the Bible, we meet almost all the main characters had a lot of trouble. They had adversity. They had trials. That's what makes them so exciting because these were people who knew how to turn defeat into victory. They knew how to turn trials into triumph. And that's why I'm calling my message this morning, turning trials into triumph. Because we all have trials. We have times of trouble. But instead of becoming victims, we can be victors through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's so many examples in the Bible. Of course, we all love the story of Joseph. Great. Great trials and great victory. Ladies, we have Esther. Of course, we have Ruth and Naomi through the great trial of loss. Husband, son, I mean, the victories that they received. So we're going to just talk about that because, and I've mentioned it, ad, uh, adversity or trouble is universal. Everybody has it. You don't need to feel guilty and you don't need to feel alone. You're not the only one that has struggles in your life. I want to talk for just a moment as we begin about the source of trials because uh, there's a lot of different uh, <laughs> theology in this direction, but I want to say that some trials come simply because we're human. Sickness, accidents, disappointments, they are a normal part of life. Everybody has them. I don't know if this is going around here in uh, Bangalore, but in Hyderabad, we've been having a, a, an epidemic of um, conjunctivitis, which we also call pink eye. And if you know anything about it, and you surely do, you know that it's wildly contagious, and it's also no respecter of persons. So the first I heard about it, one of the mothers, she's a Sunday school teacher, she couldn't come that Sunday, she had to get a substitute because her children had conjunctivitis. And I thought, oh boy. Here we go. So, you know, it just went from school to school. So many of our kids got it. And the children, being loving children, gave it to their parents. So the next week, the parents were out of church. And then the teachers got it. Last Sunday, one of our uh, teacher, uh, she's a principal of one of the schools, she came up and said, uh, Sister, I wasn't here last Sunday because I had conjunctivitis. You know, it's just no respecter of persons. Everybody gets it. And... I haven't gotten it yet. <laughs> I'm so thankful. I came close meeting one of my staff members who was working on my computer called in sick the next day with conjunctivitis. 
And I was just a nervous wreck all weekend because he had, been, had his fingers on my computer and, I, and my laptop. And I thought, oh, no, oh, no. I didn't get it yet. <laughs> Some trials are really, it's their, they're our own fault. They're, they come because of our wrong choices. Uh, some people abuse their bodies, say through drugs or alcohol, but sometimes it's not those extreme, what we call extreme things, but some people just drive too fast and some people eat too much. And it's our own fault, the troubles that we bring upon ourselves. But then, of course, there's the, what you could call the two main sources. Some trials come from God and some trials come from the enemy. Now, who gets all the blame for your troubles? Not usually God. <laughs> who do we blame when anything goes wrong? The devil. The devil's after me today. And we do know that he is, the, the scripture says, and we quote this a lot, that he goes about like a roaring lion, you know, seeking whom he may devour. He is a mean old thing. But I, I want you to know today, that some trials come, you know why? Because you are believers. Now, if you think I'm making that up, I'm going to want to read 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12, and Peter emphasizes this. Beloved, he says, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you. I don't like those two words, fiery ordeal, anywhere near my name. You know, do you? But that's what that said. The fiery ordeal that has come on you for what reason? To test you. Oh, you thought exams were finished. You finished school. You graduated. You may have your post-graduation. Exams are never finished. <laughs> It's come on you to test you as though some strange thing were happening to you. Do not be surprised. The believer who expects his or her Christian life to be easy is in for a shock. And we're going to take a few minutes to talk about the attitude that we have to have toward adversity. Peter and James tell us how to have the correct attitude. If I'm going to have trials, what should my, how should I face it? If we're going to turn trials into triumphs, we have to have, not only have the right attitudes, we have to do the right things that has to lead to the right actions. So for just a few minutes, I'm going to study the first uh, the book of James, the first chapter, a few verses there, because they have four key words that help us know what to do in our time of trial. And I'm going to turn there. I know that you all have Bibles on your phones and all that good stuff. I'm old. And when you're old, you're just old-fashioned. I like to have it, you know, in black and white. Here we go. So how to have the right attitude, what is it? First of all, I want to just read that verse one more time. The right attitude is this. Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal. I'm reading Peter again that has come on you. And what does um, Peter say? But what? 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 Oh. Well, now we're going to go to James chapter 1. And he says this. Consider it pure I thought you'd feel that way. Joy, joy. <laughs> Consider it pure joy, oh, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. <laughs> now, uh, my first word is not, I'm reading from the NIV. My first word is not from the NIV. It's from good old King James translation. He says, I, the, the King James translators say, count it all joy. I'm going to start with the word count. Count it all joy. Because count, it's a financial term. We all know you have to count your money. And count actually means to evaluate. 
When, when we face the trials of life, we must evaluate the trials in the light of what God is doing in us. This explains how that we can have joy in the midst of troubles. God tells us we should expect trials. It's there in James, chapter, that verse, when you face trials. It doesn't say if you face trials. It says when you can expect trials. Jesus warned his disciples, in this world, he said, before he left, you will have trouble. John told, uh, Paul told his converts, we must go through hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Don't be surprised. That's the reason we can have joy. But as we look into these verses, I want to talk about this heading. Adversity has a purpose. Trouble has a purpose. And the second key word is the word know. What do Christians know that makes it easier to face trials and to benefit from them? It's there in verse 3. You know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. I love how it's expressed or translated in the New Living Translation. It says it like this. When your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Faith is always tested. We know what happened to Abraham when God called him. The severe test that Abraham being asked, was given being asked to sacrifice his own son. He tested him to increase his faith. God always tests us to bring out the best. Satan, he doesn't. He tempts us to bring out the worst. But God tests us to bring out the best. And I want to say this about testing too. It's, it is uh, in 1 Peter Four in that 12 and 13. I keep jumping back and forth between 1 Peter and James, but I love this about testing. There is a, there's a perk. There is a bonus that comes from testing. And I've already read part of it. Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you. We read that. But rejoice. Now, rejoice. Why? That you participate in the suffering of Christ. I love the way Paul says it. I want to know Christ, he says. The power of his resurrection and to participate in his suffering. It's a privilege, beloved. It's a privilege to participate. I know we don't like, I don't like suffering. Honestly, I don't. I've had my share in life and I don't look for it. And I find it a little bit tricky to rejoice takes me a while to work my way up to joy <laughs> when I'm in trouble. But I, I do consider it, it a privilege to participate in the suffering of Christ. But I want to move on to the third word. It's in verse 4 of James chapter 1. Let perseverance, perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. That word, let. You receive... It requires your will. You have to allow God to work in your life. And what James is saying is that adversity is God's tool for our spiritual growth. He says it causes you to mature and be complete. It's a tool. I, I just think I can safely say this. Adversity is not a tool. It is the tool that God uses to build you up in your faith, to perfect and mature you. It's not the thing that we would choose, I'm sure, but we're talking about that. God used adversity in the lives of his children to promote spiritual growth. But you have to let him. Sometimes we don't let God have his way. There's a little chorus we used to sing, let God have his way. In your life every day, there's no peace, there's no joy. It goes on to say, until we let him have his way. 
if we remain spiritually immature, really there is a danger of eventually abandoning our faith. Our spiritual growth is so important to God, ladies, that he's willing to allow us to suffer. Trials rightly used will cause you to mature. What is it that God wants to produce in our life? He wants to produce patience, endurance, the ability to keep going when things get tough. Paul expresses it so beautifully in Romans chapter 5. We glory in our sufferings. We glory. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Adversity has a purpose. God is producing something in you. And you may be thinking, now that's just ridiculous. You know, how can anyone be so enthusiastic about growing spiritually that they would rejoice and they are happy to face trouble and trials? If that's your attitude, maybe the next few verses in James chapter 4 will help. Let's look at verse 5. James says this, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. The fourth word is ask. Ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. Now, you might say, what does wisdom have to do with it? I believe that wisdom is the ability to see things from God's perspective. We're so earthbound, ladies. We we look at everything from our point of view. But he's saying, look at the things from God's perspective. Look at it from his point of view. I believe that turning trials into triumph begins by asking the right questions. You know, when things go terribly wrong, maybe you don't do this. I do. The first question I ask is, why God? And then that's closely followed by, why me? (laughs) And then almost always by, why now? Those are all the wrong questions. And I know that. I still ask them. I'm so glad that we have a merciful God. I have thought so many times he should should strike me dead for knowing the truth and, and still asking those kind of questions. But this is the question you should ask. What? Ask in your time of trial, what, Lord, what would you have me do? Lord, what are you trying to teach me? A very important element of asking also is asking in the will of God. Do you know that God will never override his purpose to give you what you want? But what I love is in his purpose, there's always a great exchange. When I face my times of greatest difficulty, I cling on to this promise. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Hallelujah. I I, I don't know how important that is in my life. I love how Paul expresses it in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10. I didn't make a slide of this one. I should write it down, 2 Corinthians 12, 10. This is a beautiful verse. I am well content... For Christ's sake, with, listen to this, with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties. That's pretty well the whole list of trials, isn't it? For when I am weak, then am I strong. I want to talk for just a minute about our prayers You know, when asking is prayer, right? When it says, ask God, we know to ask is prayer. And I want to talk for just a minute about the difference between get me out prayers and get me through prayers. Most of us, me included, when we come to a time of trouble or testing, we pray, Lord, get me out. Deliver me. Didn't Jesus pray it in the garden? If it be your will, he did pray that, that this cup pass from me. He said, could you get me out? But I have found in life that very often the purpose of prayer is not to get us out, but it's to get us through. Because God is going to teach us something wonderful. 
We are so anxious to get out of a painful or difficult situation that we fail to grow through them. Sometimes we're so anxious to get out that we don't get anything out of the difficult situation. We lose the whole purpose. We fail to learn the lessons that God is trying to teach or to develop the character that he wants to develop in each one of us. Sometimes we need to pray, get me out prayers. But I think, I know in my life, the ones that have been most productive are the get me through. I thought about the three Hebrew boys in that fiery furnace. I love how, what they, I mean, it's just such a wonderful story. They said to the king, we know our God is able to get us out. But if not, <laughs> hallelujah. So they got thrown in the furnace. And when they got in the furnace, we don't know what they said to each other. We don't know what they said to God. I know what I say when I'm in the furnace. I say, God, where are you? You know, have you forgotten me? Do you know? Do you see where I am? And you know where God was. The king looked down in that furnace and he said, didn't we throw three men into that fire? I see four men walking around in the fire and one of them looks like the son of God. He was there. He didn't get them out. He didn't deliver them from the furnace. But beloved, he was with them in the fire. Hallelujah. I want you to know if you are facing a fire today, he is with you. He has not abandoned you. He has not deserted you. He will get you through. But pray, get me through prayers. We sing that beautiful song through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come through. May God help us to have the right kind of prayers. But I want to move on a little bit more. I know I forgot to check about my time. How much, when am I supposed to quit? 11, 10. Oh, good, relax. Oh, yeah. I'm good. The right perspective on adversity. Now we got to turn. We just and this is one of my favorite, one of my many favorite scriptures. Oh, I love this one. Second Corinthians, chapter two and verse four. Now we're we're moving a little bit, and we're going to talk from the temporary, the things of this earth to the eternal. This is what Paul wrote. I'm going to start reading at verse 16. I'm going to read verses 16 and 17 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Therefore, do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that outweighs them all. Note the contrasts. Outward, outwardly, we're wasting away. Inwardly, we are being renewed. And it talks about day by day and measured against eternity. It talks about our light, our momentary afflictions against the, uh, the old James, the King James says, weight of glory, against the glory of God. Look at the contrast. And then they're achieving, they're working for us. They're not working against us. The things that God sends our way are working for us. Paul was writing with eternity's values in view. When he weighed the present trials against the future glory, he discovered that his trials were actually working in his favor. Now, we all love, well, I'm sure we all do, I do, Romans 8, 28. We quote it so often, and we know that what? In all things, God does what? He works. He works for the good of those. It's a wonderful verse. But do we ever relate it to trials? I want the good to be a get-me-out kind of good. <laughs> I want God to spare me to work for good so that I don't have to face trouble, that I don't have to face 
sickness, so I don't have to face some of these things that come our way. I just want to assure you, your suffering is never wasted. Because God, will, he, he does something in you. He's building you up. He's building you up for the glory of God. He's building you up to be a blessing to others. You know others are watching you. They're watching to see how you come through your time of trial, through your time of testing. You are going to be a testimony to many people. But how is he glorified in our trials? By giving us the abundant grace we need to keep our joy, to keep our peace, to keep going on. You know who learned this lesson? The Apostle Paul. Remember? He had a thorn in the flesh, which we don't even really know what it was. But he had some kind of a bothersome illness or handicap. And he says, I prayed. I asked the Lord three times, get me out. <laughs> heal, heal me, Lord. And what did the Lord tell him? God says no sometimes. God wanted Paul to have a handicap. He said, he said, why? Because God wanted his purpose to be fulfilled in Paul. He wanted to weaken Paul's own ability to minister. He didn't want him to minister in his own strength. It was a strength of man. He wanted him to be able to minister in God's omnipotent, never-ending power. He said to Paul, the reason I'm not going to take it away is my grace is sufficient for you. And then the next phrase, for what? My power, hallelujah, my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul would never have had the power that he had if he was going in his own strength. But when he went in his own weakness, he could say, Lord, I'm counting on you. You promised and I'm weak. I'm going to latch on to your power. In your power, I can do great things. In your power, I can come through this time of testing. In your power, I can believe for my unsaved loved ones. We have power because we are weak in the Lord. I want to ask a question. Do you think that our prayers can change circumstances? I, I think so. I believe they can. Definitely. Definitely they can. I just am very th thankful that the Lord doesn't always answer my prayers the way I ask. <laughs> because uh, when my circumstances don't change, it's usually an indication that God is trying to change me. The main purpose of prayer is not to change our circumstances, but it is to change us. But either way, the main purpose is to glorify God, to bring him glory in every situation. I think if we were completely honest, most of us would agree that our prayers, they're usually about our personal comfort more than God's glory. I, I, I would say mine are, sadly. We want to pray away every problem, but those prayers might short-circuit God's perfect plan. Because this is the bottom line, suffering brings honor and glory from God, and I believe it brings honor and glory to God. Romans 8, 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Any time that God delivers us from adversity, as he often does, the glory connected with it is really only temporary. I'm thinking of Lazarus. Remember Lazarus? He died. And then four days later, a marvelous, marvelous miracle. God raised him from the dead. But you know what happened? A few years later, I don't know how many years later, Lazarus died again. I mean, how many people had to die twice? Well, Lazarus, the widow of Nain's son, not very many people. But, you know, he, he still had to die. That's just what, you know, this life, temporary life is about. Eventually, he died for good. 
But the glory that con was connected with his being alive, it was short-lived. But I want to suggest to you this morning that God has established a means by which our suffering can result in eternal, eternal glory. Glory that exalts not only him, but also those who have suffered. When I was uh, writing this message and when I was work thinking these thoughts, early in the morning, the Lord brought to my mind something which I had just reread recently, and it's a story you're all very familiar with. It's the story of a uh, missionary who worked with the lepers, Graham Staines, and his two sons, and the th very, I don't know what word to describe, the death there when they were burned alive in that Jeep. And I had just recently reread the book. It's called Flames of Fire. It's written by one of the eyewitnesses that was there that day. And I remember, I went back to look it up again, I, I, and I, I'm quoting from the book. This is the report. When that happened, when that was, and the flames were going up, and nobody, you know, the, the uh, people were around preventing anybody from coming in to rescue them, and they were screaming and dancing around, and it was just a, really a demonic scene. Some of the villagers that weren't there in that circle, they were on the other side, this is what they said. We could see two white angels coming down when the bodies were in flames. The angels were singing as when the child Jesus is born. They had heard the story of Christmas. The angels were singing as when the child Jesus was born. I just want to say there was glory. There was glory. It was God was manifesting his glory. And I'm sure those angels were sent to carry the spirits of those precious ones to, into the presence of God. But when we go through times of trial, I don't want you to forget there is always glory. There is glory. We, we forget that. We always, we do, we center and we, on the suffering but there is glory. There's also a reward for adversity. And I like this. And actually, I'm already at the end. And so we have lots of time to do whatever else we want to do. <laughs> but this is the reward. There is a bonus for suffering. A trial not only leads to spiritual maturity in this life, but it purchases for us a crown in the next. <laughs> it's in James chapter 1. Same chapter we're in. Verse number 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. That's nice. There's a crown. Adversity when handled properly, provides for the believer glory and honor in the life to come. Are you persevering? Are you enduring? Or are you resisting? You know, something that I see as a pastor often in life Trials do not always make us better. You know what they do sometimes? They make us bitter. We have a, 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 a just recently we had an incident. Just there was a wedding about a week ago. And there's been a kind of a sad thing in the family. One of the family members is has been inflicted with illness. They're all church people. They all are church people. But the one that's afflicted, still trusting the Lord, still comes to church. But his elder brother, he's angry. He's angry at God because his brother is afflicted with a kidney uh, problem. He won't come to church. He won't have anything to do with God. He's just, he's bitter and he's angry. And uh, sadly, 
I thought it was sad. One of our young ladies just married this young man. And we asked him, well, what are you going to do on Sundays? He said, oh, I'll drop her at church, and then I'll go. He won't even darken the doorway of the church. I mean, I just want to say to you, <laughs> that's really a waste of time because uh, God's going to have to work on him to help him to understand that trials do not come to punish us. They come for our good. They come to mature us. They come to make us strong believers. We've all been through trials. The question is, how have you reacted? God wants to mature you through adversity. He wants you to grow up and mature to the point that your character is a mirror image of Christ's. That's God's goal for you. And adversity is often the means by which he will accomplish, accomplish it. Why not trust him? Will you trust him today with the things that he brings your way? I don't know what you're facing. I mean, I know some people in just these last couple months that have faced what most of us would consider unbearable, unbearable trials. Loss of an only child. Loss of a spouse. Severe sickness. But the thing that makes me so thankful to God is that those, those individuals chose through that time of terrible adversity to put their trust in God, to believe that he was bringing good into their life, that God had a purpose beyond what they could see, beyond what they could understand, and that he was bringing them to good. And I just pray that for each one of you. I think, and I just, I wrote it on the PowerPoint, this is what we need to pray when we come to a time of testing. Lord, I don't like it. It's okay to say that. We can be honest with God. I don't like it. But by faith, I rejoice that you are up to something good in my life. This is what I believe the Lord would have us to learn about turning trials into triumphs. If God takes you out, we will be rejoicing with you and we will be very thankful. But if you are going through a time of testing, I want to just say this, hear the message that we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, do not lose heart. Because God's doing something of eternal value, something that far outweighs the things of this earth, something that's much heavier, much weightier, even than my troubles and my trials will be the glory of God. May God bless you, dear ladies, and may he give you grace equal to every trial. And may he give you triumphs in every tribulation. And I'm not sure what I'm, if I'm supposed to turn this to somebody else. You may come, my dear. You're right in the front. Yes. She said that we can take some questions. Yeah, so if anyone has any questions that they would like to ask Pastor Arlene, you can just raise your hand and there'll be a mic that will be passed around. And uh, uh, to our Zoom participants as well, if you have a question for Pastor Arlene, you can just put it in the chat and we will uh, read it out because we have some time. So are there any questions? You can raise your hand. There's a question there. There's someone at the back. Yeah. Is there a mic back there? Yes. yes. There will be. 
I just have to put this. Uh, Hi, Pastor. I'm yes. Joshna here. Yes, thank so you. Can I you see please you. be specific on uh, what you mean when you say trials and testings? What kinds of come from God? Okay. I thought about starting with that, but I thought we all have so many. We probably, you know, I mentioned them actually at the beginning. The things that come in the natural are, it can be sickness. It can be, uh, I'll tell you what I, I think is a great trial. I mean, I'll, I'll mention a few. But uh, we talked about it. The things that uh, are just part of uh, normal life, they are the meat trials, uh, accidents. I've known people that have had serious, I, was, I read so many stories when I was preparing this. I read the story and the testimony of Joni Erickson, who, you know, was uh, uh, paralyzed from the neck down, I believe, and, you know, as an athlete, and, uh, you know, her, her whole life. She's been, and her, she has such a marvelous testimony. Accidents. These are things, it's any kind of suffering, I think, is a trial. Uh, it can be sickness. It can be, I think, one of the greatest, of the course, the greatest trial I've ever had to endure in my life is death. I mean, not my own. I'm still here. But I mean the death of my, I lost my own spouse. You know, I, after, I'll tell you how I felt after I lost that, my, that after that trial. I said, Lord... I'm never going to complain about anything again in the rest of my life. I haven't actually kept that promise. But I said that. I did say that. Because I said, I have come through the absolute worst thing I know, and, I, and I'm still alive. I'm still here. So I can, en I can endure anything now. <laughs> That's what I thought. But then uh, trials, testing, uh, trouble, trouble. Some, with some people, it may be finances. I think with a lot of us as m women, our trials and our troubles involve our families. It involves our husbands, our children, because some of us uh, have unbelieving spouses or children that are not following the Lord. I mean, these are the kind of things that they, they come to all of us in our time, even those of us who have believing spouses. Sometimes our children, I mean, grow up in Sunday school, and then they just go off. They wander off somewhere, you know, along the way. And uh, I, I just, I clump it all together. When, I, when the Bible talks about trials, or when it talks about adversity, I think it would cover any of the above, or all of the above. Now, Amy's here. She'll tell you if that's true. Is there a better way to describe trials or adversity? Because we all have them. We're not talking about a trial like in a court where there's a judge. We're talking about testing. The Bible calls it, the Bible calls it testing. That's really the biblical word. That's what we read in so many of the scriptures. He t does it to test your faith. I think, to me, a trial is anything that causes us great pain. For various ones of us, it might be different things. What I consider unbearable, some of you would probably think, I can handle that. <laughs> God knows. God knows you. He knows your heart. I think the hardest thing for us as mothers is... Uh, things that affect our children. When our children are not well, or when our children have handicaps, or when they are not in the Lord, I consider that a great trial or a great trouble. Um, Pastor, we have a question from our online viewers. Okay. Uh, it's, how do we know if a trial is from the enemy or from God? Because the approach in prayer would be very different, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question, isn't it? It's a good question. You know what I think most of us do? I do, pretty much. If I have a trouble, I, uh, I blame the devil, first of all. Uh, that's, that's my default, you know, I go, that's where I go. 
because I know he's an enemy, I know he's a liar, I know he's out to get me. I mean, you know, the Bible says that. So that is my default explanation that devil's in this. But then, as I begin to pray, and as I begin to examine my own life, then I begin to, that's when you, if you are willing to let God have his way in your life, if you're willing to pray, Lord, not my will, your will be done, then God will begin to work in your life. He really can't do the maturing process. He can't do the perfecting process in your life without your permission, without your express will, without your letting and allowing him to do that. But uh, I usually am very slow. I never blame anything on God. I blame everything on the devil. But I do find that most of the things that happen in my life, even my greatest hour of trial, the night my husband suddenly died unexpectedly of a heart attack, I knew it wasn't the devil <laughs> because he's a child of God. When we're a child of God, the devil cannot touch. He, even Job, there was a limit. As much as he was able to test him, he allowed it, but he did not allow him to take his life. He does not have the authority over your, over your life, the enemy or your husband's life, or your children's life. I knew that only God would take his own child, that the devil would never have it. He could not do that. So then I, I knew I had to see what's God's purpose. I had to just say, Lord, your will, your will be done. I prayed. Oh, did I pray? I'm sitting in the emergency room, and I see my husband comes in with a heart attack and I'm standing right beside him and I'm watching the monitor and suddenly I see a flat line. And the nurse didn't even notice. She, I don't know what she was. The doctor was on the phone and uh, I had to you know, call them and come. But in, as they were working you know, and trying to restore his heartbeat, I, I gave the Lord you hundreds of reasons, literally, why he had to heal him right then and there. And, uh, but God, God's will is always done in every circumstance for his children. I just want to, if we allow God, he will show us. Oh, and you are here. <laughs> are are there any you. more questions? Okay, there's one more question here. If there's anyone else also, can you raise your hand now so we can... Pass the mic quickly. Thank you, Pastor Arlene. Awesome. Yeah. Just blessed our hearts. Hi. I'm Ghazala. And um, my question too is just trying to leverage all the benefit. You don't want to go through those so many years from your experience, right? My question is so many battles, so many sources. How have you fought those long drawn battles? I'm sure you felt battle weary a lot of times, like most uh -huh. of us do. Yeah. Yeah, that you do get battle weary. But there's, there's so many scriptures. This is the thing. I, I'm a little bit sorry, I say sorry, that this was the uh, topic given to me <laughs> to speak to you this morning about uh, adversity. And that's not a very uh, cheerful subject. But you know, the good news is the Bible is full of encouragement as well. You know, it, this is not, this is only a part of the story. But I think it's an important part. I'll tell you why I think it's so important. I think it's important because very often we don't allow God to do what he wants to do in our lives. Because we resist, because we fight, because we're not willing to accept what is his will, we don't have the what God, the good thing. We don't learn the good, the good lessons. We don't receive the good that God would do in our lives. So I think that is uh, something that uh, I, 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 I do just like you do when I go through time of trial. I say every uh, positive scripture I know in the Bible. You know, one of my favorite ones is I know that in all things, 
in all things. And I'll say that when I get, I, I say it every day. I'm sure every day when I have some, I'll say, all means all, Lord. All means all. But you know what's in the rest of that, before that in the verse? It's talking about suffering. I realized that when I was uh, reading, the, uh, preparing this message. Oh my goodness, my favorite scripture, you know, that, you know, he, in all things, you know, he gives me strength. And it's talking about giving me strength for suf in suffering. I thought, oh, Lord, I didn't realize that. I mean, I quote that verse all the time. <laughs> I still believe it, and he still does, because I think in my hour of greatest weakness, hallelujah, hallelujah, in my hour of greatest weakness, then am I strong. The problem is it goes against the grain of human thinking. And it certainly goes against the grain of the thinking of this world in this age. And, you know, about women's lib, I'm strong, I'm powerful, I can do anything. Well, <laughs> we are... The, and then Paul says, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. You have to figure it out, ladies. <laughs> you have to just pray and say, Lord, what are you doing? What are you doing in my life? I believe God brings us through to great victory. Uh, I, I, can, I was just going to tell a story, but I don't have time. Uh, I'll tell you just a little incident. I knew the Lord, wanted, after my husband died, I took his body home for burial, and I... Then what to do, my daughters, I have two daughters, they wanted me to stay. They wanted me to stay in the U.S. They didn't want me to go back to India. And, uh, but I knew God wanted me to come, and I knew I needed to be there for the church. And uh, I was praying, Lord, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And uh, there was, while I was gone, I was only gone for six weeks. I went back six weeks later to India, came back to Hyderabad. And... Uh, there were two men that were making a little bit of problem in the church. They were trying to kind of take over because there was like a leadership vacuum. My husband was gone. I wasn't there. We were the pastors. There were no other pastors on staff then. There are now. And uh, so I said, Lord, you know that India is a, a man's world. And, uh, you know, when I go back as a woman, you know, how am I going to, you know, I'm not going to go you know, in with this great authority cracking a big whip or something. And I said, what am I going to do about these two individuals? I don't even know. And uh, in my de devotions one day, in the book of Isaiah, the seventh chapter, the Lord led me to that verse where uh, the prophet goes to the king who's terrified because his country is being invaded, the king of Israel or Judah. And he says, uh, he gives him this promise that God is going to uh, take care of, he calls them two smoldering stumps of firewood. And when I read that verse in the seventh chapter, it just leaped out at me, two, not three or four, two. And I was praying about two things. I said, Lord, if you can handle those two things, the rest of the team and I, we can, we'll, take, we'll do the rest with your help. I, it was just so amazing to me because I thought, I, I can't do, I'm not a man, and I'm not a, a great administrator, and I'm not a great preacher. I'm not great anything. I'm just me. I love to work with children, and I like music, and, you know, what, 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 how, can I, how can God use me? But God, he, from the time I returned, one of those smoldering stumps of filed wood never showed up again in the church. He used to come and sit right in the front just to try to intimidate the person that was preaching. <laughs> Never came back again when he heard I was back. The second one became one of my staunchest supporters. Anytime I needed help, he was always there until the Lord took him home. You know, the Lord has a way, even in our weakness. We don't have to be tough. We just have to trust. We just have to trust that what he does is good and what he does is right, and that he'll always do what is best, he'll do what is good for you. Yeah. 
I think I have used it up, that precious commodity called time. Check, check, okay. Um, Okay, we have one last question okay. uh, from our online viewers. Uh, it's, pain causes us to become numb, so how do we rise through the trials? Okay. I guess numb in a way. I was going to say, I hate pain. I'm not brave. <laughs> but uh, I guess it has a way of... Phys I mean, not physically numbing us, we feel the pain, but mentally we become, I don't know, how do we rise through the trials? I, I just, I use those same scriptures. I, I'll tell you the truth. There's just nothing like the word of God. If you want to have victory, you just need to know the word and you need to use the word because the word of God is powerful and it is a weapon. And I, if I think that it's something that's coming from the devil, even if I don't, I, I'll still use the words that I, that I know, the scriptures that I know. But I pray over and over and over again that, uh, you know, in, in all things, God works for my good. I believe it with all my heart. I pray that your, I say your strength is made perfect in weakness. I pray it over and over and over. And I don't know if the Lord gets tired of hearing it. I don't think so because I never get tired of praying it because I know that my strength is not mine. It's not in my ability, but it's in his power. Beloved, if we're not connected to his power, we really are powerless. You know, if we can't do it in our own strength, and I, I feel the same way about pain. I think uh, that constant pain is, is a terrible thing. Those of you who have that, I, I help and I've dealt and counseled with people. It's, it's, it is a mind-numbing thing. But just keep hanging on to God. Just pray that he'll bring you through. I've known people that have come through to deliverance, deliverance from pain. And deliverance, I mean, God gives answers in so many ways, but don't ever give up. Don't ever give up claiming the promise of God. You will become a victor, not a victim. <laughs>